Welcome to Extraordinary League, an actual play RPG podcast brought to you by Smash Fiction. I'm Dan Mulcairn, your Game Master. Playing Stitch is Kit Mulcairn. Wise men say only fools rush in, but I'll never leave behind a cousin. Oh, <laughs> that was cute. The symbiote was not a cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Playing Dante is Liz Logan. Uh, can someone get me some chamomile or like <laughs> hard liquor? Uh, either one will do. I mean, you can put them both in the same cup. That's fine. Yeah, listeners, uh, Liz Logan is currently suffering from some laryngitis, and Dante will be extra scruffy this month. Dante needs some whiskey. <laughs> sure does. Playing Dante Sparta is Milhouse. <laughs> <laughs> Playing Nico Minoru is Miles Schneiderman. Reintroduction! <laughs> Playing Helena from Orphan Black is Megan Bob. Did you threaten Extraordinary League? You should not threaten Extraordinary League. <laughs> they are my other bigger babies. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already excited. Playing Morden Solis is Claire Mulcairn. Morden Solis was grabbed by Phyrexia's yes! lab because he was looking incomplete. And Sterling Archer japed but didn't help them escape. <laughs> Stitch through everything that he couldn't eat. Dante Sparta arose and took off his clothes. Somehow they barely <laughs> managed to get away. Now when worlds get mixed, they travel betwixt. Maybe they'll all get back home someday. It's a smash fiction. <laughs> Monthly feature. Dan won't let Miles be that guy from Preacher. <laughs> Here, Luna, love good. Always making new friends. Oh, shoot, I rolled a white. How much karma should I spend? Whoa. Because we are the extraordinary league. <laughs> Well, there's our new theme song right there. <laughs> yeah, we won't get sued at all. Previously, you managed to hold off a Phyrexian invasion force long enough to save Nexus City itself, and snagged yourself the second of the five gems necessary to defeat the Parasitic Plane once and for all. Your struggles weren't without consequence, though. Stitch's raptor companion Lace was infected, and Stitch was forced to sacrifice his symbiote in an effort to save her. So, you've all returned to Castle Grayskull, along with numerous warriors from the Nexus Tournament who are eager to join the cause after witnessing the horrors of Phyrexia. The castle has been a busy place recently, with new faces coming and going, getting assigned to new cells, and going out on missions. Sterling Archer, along with his teacher Roland Deschain, have decided to search through some of the planes that used to make up Nexus City in search of any stray Phyrexians that were left behind. Luna Lovegood has also returned to one of these planes, although in her case, it's to take her new friend Venusaur on a trip to the zoo. <laughs> the rest of you have had some time since your last mission to rest and recover, or possibly just, you know, to get into trouble. Uh, what have each of you been up to? Well, very shortly after coming back to the portal, Stitch quickly realizes that his legs are giving out from under him and he falls back down, the symbiote that was allowing him to walk. Uh, God. Oh, no! Correct. <gasps> the injury that you suffered on Westeros during the battle with Dracula uh, has left you paraplegic, and as you correctly pointed out, without the symbiote, you are not able to walk. I mean, he got, he got strong little front arms. Sure. So is Stitch just walking around in a perpetual handstand? I imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it. Yeah. Uh, but he's probably going to go check on that little T-Rex that he left with Nico in well, that bleeding room. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Stitch goes up to Nico's room. Nico! Nico! 
Pulls door off of wall. <laughs> so, I... so, Sti- so Stitch was on one arm while knocking there? Yeah. Well, no, she, she he crawled up to the door and was oh, like, wow. yeah. Ha- have you seen his core? Now, how you're going to get the leverage to pull the door off the wall, I don't know. Oh, but... I mean, it's probably not going to come off in one piece. That's not his problem. <laughs> it's never his problem. No, no, it isn't. Hi. Nico, what does Stitch see when he pulls open the door? It's like, there's like totally doing the light as a feather stiff as a board in there with the tiny T-Rex. <laughs> <laughs> I love how that's the evil sorcery from the Tome of Eternal Darkness. <laughs> all, the, all the lights are off. There are a couple of candles still burning, but they're going to go out soon because there's no candle left. There's a bunch of like piles of just melted wax all over the place. Oh, he can see in the dark. So mm-hmm. his eyes go all night vision. Is worth a, is a little T Rex in here? Yeah. Uh, when the door is pulled piece by piece off of the wall, you see that the tiny T Rex comes running out from under Nico's bed and hugs onto you, and you can see he's got a little bit of like a thousand yard stare going on. <laughs> <laughs> Cousin. He lets out a little squeaky roar. He like pets him on his tiny. He's still pretty tiny, right? Oh yeah, he's yeah, very tiny. Pets him on his tiny little head. He he uh, he nibbles on your arm affectionately. Aww. Where's Nico? Nico's in a in a corner of the room, sitting reading a book, not paying any attention. Stitch uh, patters over with his with his well his arms, I guess. N- Nico? Nico. He puts his like face in her face. <laughs> <laughs> nah, nah. He like is opening his mouth and making faces at her to try and get like some kind of reaction. There's a lot of dust. Yeah, so lots of dust, and uh, looks like Nico hasn't changed in a while or bathed, and just reading the book. There's. There's spider webs attached to you, Nico. <laughs> uh, okay, bye. <laughs> Nico, uh, I will say that one interesting thing you've found while perusing the Tome of Eternal Darkness uh, is that tucked in between a couple of pages is a strange-looking stone amulet. Oh, really? Yes. There's mysterious flowing writing of some kind uh, all along the edges, and uh, there's the image of some sort of, like, winged creature on the face of it. Interesting. So I have that. That's nice to know. Yep, you have that. You have the Tome of Eternal Darkness, uh, and you have probably some malnutrition from <laughs> not having left your room in a while. <laughs> that's that's for sure. Definitely some vitamin D deficiency. She's uh, She's got the sp- she magically enchanted the spiders to, like, make them bring her, mm. her uh, some Lunchables. <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a good trick. <laughs> Morden has been really sick of me following him around. <laughs> so he injected me with a super secret virus to get me sick and <laughs> asked Lara Croft to take care of me. So I'm currently in bed being taken care of by Lara Croft. So <laughs> no one's heard or seen from me since. <laughs> I feel like she has better things to do than take care of your ass. That's rude. <laughs> What could she possibly so, have to do that's more important than taking care of Dante? Thank you. I can, I, if, you don't, if you don't mind me, like, yes ending this a little bit, I think that what I probably needed Dante for is I need some guinea pigs to run mind control experiments on because I recovered all of that technology from Shang Tsung. Oh, great. And I was, and I, maybe I injected him with, with some experimental compounds that I thought would lower his resistance to the mind control because I wasn't getting a reaction. And there may be some, you know, adverse side effects or whatever, but, you know, so we're testing sure. stuff out. We're working the kinks out. But yeah, I, I've reached a bit of a dead end there. So just to like clear my mind, I've spent the last couple hours trying to see if I can come up with a solution to um, Stitch's paralysis. What, what is it that you would like to, uh, to kind of work on? Uh, Stitch's paralysis comes from the fact that he suffered some extensive spinal damage during the fight. So are you looking for a way to heal that? Are you looking to develop like sort of external prosthetics that could help him move? Um, are you looking to, you know, transfer his mind into a new robo body? Like <laughs> what's your what's your uh, path to success here? I've been working on ways to make an experimental metagel that's more aggressive and that can repair more long term damage. And I've been experimenting with it and it's something that I think could reverse the sort of damage that was gained and like th- that could like regenerate limbs and do all sorts of things that normal metal gel can't. So, um, Stitch is going to see Morton trying to do this reparative stuff. And, you know, if Morton tries to come at him with it, Stitch actually pushes it away and then points at Lace. And it's like, no, use it on her. Um, how is, how has Lace been doing? 
Since you guys took her back, she's been kept in a medically induced coma until it can be determined that she's not actually a danger. You and the uh, emergency medical hologram have been keeping a close eye on her, and she actually registers on your scanners as being infected. Yeah. But the infection does not appear to have spread past the wound on her side, which has never happened before. Uh, Phyrexian infection is always extremely aggressive, right. um, but this is the first time you've ever seen it, like, go dormant before. And even though I've done a couple, like, autopsies on him, I imagine we still don't know very much about how the infection works, right? And I don't really, we don't have any ways of, like, curing it or anything like that, right? Uh, no, but, I mean, Lace presents you with a very interesting opportunity of seeing, like, what the symbiote did to her and potentially providing you with a means of replicating it or or of like continuing the process once you understand it with lace so great morta now has a third project to be working on all i have to do is figure out how to reverse par paralysis and develop mind control and then also reverse the phyrexian infestation which is something that has been plaguing the multiverse for who knows how long decades if not centuries yeah. so yeah, that's no big deal. That's Should just, I, I can knock those three out in a weekend. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Fix lace first. <laughs> Dante, while you are in bed, you've been having some, uh, some interesting dreams. Your dreams are filled with darkness and cold. And uh, when you wake up in the morning, you find that you're even more tired than you were when you went to sleep initially. You look like you've been getting paler and more gaunt recently. Oh no, you're and, losing muscle mass, bruh. And, Are you sure uh, this is every... Dante or like actually me, Liz Logan? Because yeah, I know. it really <laughs> could it's be very either. appropriate. <laughs> but uh, every now and again, you will hear the sound of Frostmourne's tuneless song of ice with increasing frequency. Can Morden put something in my brain to shut that up too? <laughs> <laughs> Because he's got the time. Yeah, totally. So this will be an awkward conversation. Yeah, do you want to roleplay the conversation where you ask Morden to, oh, to I help love this. with your yeah. sword craze with your sword madness? <laughs> he's got the sword madness. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Dante comes into the office I'm like, oh, Dante, I did not know we had an appointment scheduled for today. Is there something I can do for you? How are you feeling? You don't look well. Well, I keep having this dream. Where I unsheathe. Mort Morden rolls his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I keep having this dream where I unsheath my sword. <laughs> and I take it in my hand. <laughs> and I have to swing it around. <laughs> it drives me crazy, but I have to do it. It's like my sword is thinking for me. <laughs> I don't know what to do Well I've heard that humans sometimes have Dreams that have Symbolism That can reflect things that are going on In their Conscious well, And the worst part Is that freaking Laura Croft's been in my room All day I see you think she seems to be Exasperating the issue <laughs> I mean, I don't want to talk to her about swinging my sword. That'll just creep her out. Oh, so this has just been happening recently, ever since we got back from Nexus City? No. I think it was when I first got my hands on that sword. And I mean, like, that actual sword. Oh, the one from Westeros, with all of the skulls and whatnot. <laughs> yeah, I mean... You knew I was talking about that sword, right? <laughs> <laughs> Morden quickly scratches out the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the hysteria that he was writing down. I did feel a strange sensation when I was in its presence. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I got the sword after our night in the castle. <laughs> now I'm confused. <laughs> Handing me that sword, I'll see if I can run some tests. Morden adds a fourth item <laughs> to, his, <laughs> to his list of things. Dante unbuckles his pants. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a, a new person wandering around Castle Grayskull as well. Yes. So I think Helena probably spends a lot of time in the kitchen because she does love eating. And then now there's this weird little blue thing crawling around on its front legs. You know, seeing it out of the corner of her eye and then also going over and, like, kind of watching surreptitiously from around corners. Like, what is that? But I think she's probably going to go up to Stitch and be like, little blue thing, can I help huh? you? 
He turns and he, and, and, he, and he sniffs at her. Now that Stitch is seeing you for the first time, Megan, Bob, can you give a description of your new character for people who might not have watched Orphan Black? Kind of average height, crazy, blonde, frizzy, long hair that sort of almost spouts out of her head. It's pretty impressive. She just looks perpetually sick, like pale, and then the red around her eyes. And kind of skulky, if that's if that's a, a thing one can be. <laughs> and uh, what's she wearing in this scene? The parka! I know, I'm going to say the parka, <laughs> even though that makes no... Well, you know, Castle, Castle Grayskull probably didn't have central heating. Yeah, fuck it, the nope. parka. You're wearing a parka? Yeah, and some, like, uh, pretty tight, warm pants. And uh, some boots just hanging out. And then all definitely shoving some, like, tortilla chips in my face. All right, so, Stitch, that's what you see. Yes, Stitch, I'm going to say you come across Stitch when he's in the kitchen, raiding the... Uh, the fridge that they probably pulled from a different universe. Mm-hmm. Wait, how are they powering it? I don't know. Don't worry about it. There's someone on a bicycle somewhere. <laughs> yep. Uh, hi. Hello. <laughs> Do you need help? I can get the tall shelves. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Let reach up and then I just take down the whole like top shelf. So I like, oh, you know what? If we're going to get serious here, we're going to get serious. And just like sit down the floor with Stitch and just leave the fridge door open and we just eat from the light of the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm making a cake for lace. Oh, what is lace? Lace is um it's like a big bird. <laughs> <laughs> but no feathers. That's weird bird. That sounds like very weird bird. <laughs> she is cousin. And she's asleep. You have cousins? I have Sestras. Yeah. <laughs> She totally understands Ohana. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. Perfect. So I'm going to say Stitch and Helena make the ugliest but most delicious cake <laughs> you've ever seen. Okay. It's oh, delicious until you get to the egg center. <laughs> <laughs> the raw egg center. <laughs> do we make it all the way to giving it to Lace or do we eat half of it on the way? We probably eat some of it. Yeah. I mean, Lace don't eat all of it. <laughs> so basically, Morden, you're working in the lab <laughs> when the door slides open and in walks this crazy-haired human woman carrying a disgusting-looking cake <laughs> with Stitch riding on her back and the <laughs> and the tiny T-Rex sort of running in circles around her feet. No. Hello, Lace. I bring you little blue Sestra. No, that's not Lace. That's more... <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> he is also cousin. Sometimes? <laughs> oh. He is the sciences, yes. Yes. Shady scientist. Stitch. Does more than do good sciences or bad sciences? Depends on day. Okay. <laughs> I keep knife nearby in case. <laughs> <laughs> Stitch just nods. <laughs> She's had, Helena's had some nasty ass science exper- experiences. Oh my god. We are so bonding. Oh, dead. <laughs> can, can I please burst back into the room with my hands down my, the front of my pants? Oh, please, please do. Boom. You never need to ask. Wait, Doc, I don't know. Oh, hi, Hello. everybody. Um, hi. Yeah, okay. And I turn around and walk out. Oh, no, I think <laughs> Helena's going to stop you and then go over and touch your, because you have that crazy silver hair, don't you? Yeah. I like your hairs. <laughs> That's the nicest thing anyone said to me in a long time. <laughs> That's because I am wonderful. I like your hairs. Thank you. <laughs> I'm gonna go now, <laughs> but I'll talk to you later. Take some cake! And he throws it at the door. <laughs> After I walk out. <laughs> <laughs> just hits the door, slides right. to the this ground. This fucking room, this fucking medical room is just gonna be covered in cake. <laughs> Not exactly a sterile cake environment anymore. Cake in French. <laughs> Martin looks up from his experiment and says, that's uh, Dante. He's... A very nice and interesting person. You should get to know him better. T- t- spend a lot of time with him. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you condemn her like that? Helena is going to just withhold a snarl. <laughs> uh, more than making friends as always. <laughs> All right. So basically, uh, at this point in the story, Castle Grayskull is mostly empty. The five of you are there. Lace is there. The tiny T-Rex are there. And there's a handful of other leaguers that are not currently on other missions off-world. So uh, each of you can name a character that is present at Castle Grayskull at the moment. So it can be 
an NPC that we've used in the past. It could be a character that you've played in the past. It could be a completely new character that you want to introduce. Uh, whatever it is that you guys want to do. Oh, shit. I didn't know. Yeah. So oh. give that some thought. All right. So uh, clearly, clearly, I am going with Finn Balor. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Timothy Dalton, James Bond forever. <laughs> I'll choose uh, Sir Didymus so uh, non-patrons get to hear him. I'll choose Amethyst, because Amethyst. And I'll choose Mad Max. Yeah! (laughs) (laughs) So during this downtime, at some point, there is suddenly a thunderous impact from near the front of Castle Greyskull, audible from everywhere in the castle. And then this is followed by a second impact and then a third impact, all of which are incredibly loud and are clearly represent something very large hitting the front of the castle. What do all of you do? Well, Stitch is going to go investigate. Yeah. Does does the castle have any sort of like security? Like, are there cameras and stuff or or guards or? Stitch is going to go throw the trebuchet at at the (laughs) enemies. It's probably using it wrong. There are no cameras or guards. Uh, it's just just the castle. All right. Is the building shaking? Uh, yes, there is a vibration that happens every time you f- you uh, hear one of those impacts. Martin makes plans to uh, talk to whoever's in charge of security here about getting a better system in place. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and then, yeah, we're going to go check it out. Apparently, it's the guy who was in charge of security recently got this, like, weird Dilophosaurus poison spit in his face, so he's <laughs> not around anymore. <laughs> Nico, I'm, I'm curious, are you uh, going to investigate or are you remaining in your room? So I'm trying to decide if Nico would hear this or not right now, because she's, yeah. she's deep in someone else's story. <laughs> yeah. In every Shit. sense of that term. Oh, yeah, you're in like 14th century France right now. Yeah, <laughs> so I kind of think she's going to keep reading until like, I don't know, I feel like somebody's going to need, like something is going to have to shake her out of it that's gonna, more than just like the castle thumping. All right, sounds good. So uh, all of you, except for Nico, climb out onto the parapets of the castle and look out over the field that Castle Grayskull overlooks. And what you see is arrayed outside of the castle gates is a small army. And it's like hundreds, if not thousands strong. And this is a very colorful and eclectic looking group. Uh, There's mutants and monsters Mm -hmm. and cyborgs and robots and other creatures that defy description. There's various vehicles and siege weapons that sit amongst this army, and all of them are aimed toward the castle. And as you arrive, one of them opens fire with a large cannon. It fires a laser which impacts several feet out from the walls of Castle Greyskull and crashes uselessly against an invisible magical force field and makes that same thunderous impact sound that you've been hearing. Would you say the army looks super 80s? Uh, very 80s, very bright and colorful. (laughs) Towards the middle of this crush of soldiers is a walker vehicle designed to look like a huge black and red spider with its uh, central body and open platform. Standing on top of it is the blue-gray-skinned gargoyle known as Demona, who up until recently was herself a member of the Extraordinary League until she turned on her cell and had to be chased out of Castle Greyskull by Morden, Dante, Stitch, and Archer. With her on the vehicle is a blue-skinned muscular figure whose face, which is a bare skull, grins out from beneath a shadowy hood. It's this figure who speaks out, and his voice has apparently been magically amplified to boom out over the army and reach your ears on top of the castle. I'm glad to see I have your attention. (laughs) (laughs) Allow me to introduce myself. I am Skeletor, overlord of evil and rightful ruler of Eternia. There is a power that lies within that castle, and I intend to have it. I have no quarrel with you and your league, and if you value your lives, you will leave the castle now. Otherwise, I will have no choice but to destroy you. This is your only warning. Stitch is going to tug on Helena's sleeve and then point at Demona and say, She betrayed our family. Yes, she looked like a bitch. (laughs) (laughs) And that guy next to her looks stupid. (laughs) It is weird that he is wearing so very little pants. <laughs> <laughs> Skeletor is looking very perturbed by the blatant lack of respect you are all showing him. 
seeing as it's fairly clear to him that you aren't about to give up Grayskull, he turns to Demona and nods. Demona brings up both of her hands above her head with magical energy surging into the space between her palms. We cut now to several close-up shots of various rooms inside Grayskull as runes that she secretly left there months ago suddenly begin to flare with power and blinding light. And one of these runes is in Nico's room. Suddenly, there are a series of thunderclaps as explosions rip through several areas in the castle. The overall structure of Castle Grayskull is largely undamaged, but apparently these magical detonations were quite precisely placed as a dome of light flickers around the castle before dying as the magical force field protecting Grayskull fades away. Skeletor's army lets loose a battle cry and begins to surge forward toward the castle. Oh, hell no. That rune that she put in Nico's room, right on top of Nico's visual K posters. <laughs> like, <laughs> fuck them all up. Not okay. Uh, she blew up my prisoner's DVDs. That's right. <laughs> There's a couple of issues to address right away. So first of all, several of the monsters in the army have a large heavy-duty vehicle, which looks kind of like a tank with a large shark head-like design on the front of it. Uh, this vehicle yes. has chains trailing from the back of it, which the monsters are using to grapple onto Castle Grayskull's retracted drawbridge. The obvious intent is then to use the vehicle to pull down the drawbridge to allow the army entrance. Secondly, there are other monstrous soldiers that are beginning to reach across the chasm around Castle Grayskull with long ladders, looking to prop up the ends of the ladders on the outer walls of the castle so that they can cross over the chasm and get into the castle that way. Third, Nico, you struggle for consciousness and realize that you are pinned beneath rubble and that there are flames which are beginning to creep toward you with no small amount of speed. You do not know what has just happened. You are off on a journey inside the Tome of Eternal Darkness, exploring the lives of one of the uh, previous owners, and uh, this is what you have very suddenly come to. You know, so, not the first time Nico's been pinned under rubble. And it won't be the last, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, she's a fucking Marvel Comics character. No, it's not <laughs> sure. the first time. So those are three major issues which are going on right now that will have to be addressed at some point. Uh, you guys can try to address those in some combination if you wish. If you have another plan that you would like to enact that you think would help to stave off the attack or possibly help with some of the damage control, you can do that as well. But those are all things that need to be taken care of in some way. So what are all of you doing? Stitch sees the people coming up on the ladders and wants to get in on that and then realizes Nico isn't here. And so he, he whips his head around and then finally l looks up at everyone else. Where's Nico? She doesn't come out of her room very much nowadays. <gasps> She's still in her room. And then he's going to pet, 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 pet. pet. Uh, as, as you come to this realization, Stitch, you feel a little like poke at your huh? side. Huh? He looks, looks uh, back. You look down, your tiny T-Rex is standing there and he's poking you with something that he has in his mouth. He, uh, he holds out his, his little paw. The T-Rex opens his jaws, and a very slobber-covered, thick coin drops into your hand. Mm -hmm. You see it has a skull design on it. Um, <laughs> uh, th thank you? <laughs> um, he's gonna, uh, put, throw it in his mouth for now. <laughs> Easiest pocket. And, uh, he's gonna keep, like, pitter-patter, pitter-patter down the halls. Uh, you go several steps before you realize that you're walking on your hind legs. <gasps> oh, good. <laughs> and then he goes he's, he goes running all the faster toward Nico. Listeners, in between sessions, Kit purchased the Coin of Cortez from Pirates of the Caribbean for Stitch. Due to the fact that it grants immortality and regeneration to whoever holds it, we decided that this would be one potential way for Stitch to be uh, somewhat more mobile once again. It doesn't seem like that much of a stretch that it would allow a zombie to walk. Yeah, no, sure. it seems pretty pretty legit. No, but you won't be able to enjoy food anymore. Oh, I know. But it'll just fall right through him <laughs> or something, but only in the moonlight. It's really weird. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Stitch is heading off to Nico's room to check up on her. What's everyone else doing about the this situation that you have going on? Shaking my head groggily and trying to get my bearings and also trying to figure out 
first and foremost where the book is, Second, secondly, if I have my staff or not. I'm going to roll to see what happened with each. So you are partially pinned under rubble. Like, the lower part of your body is uh, is underneath a large piece of stonework that broke off from the wall and landed on you. You can feel that the Tome of Eternal Darkness is lying beneath your body. And you search the room, and you can see the staff of one, and reaching for it, you realize it's just a bit beyond your fingertips. But, you know, you can easily pull it towards you magically if need be. Can I Luke Skywalker that shit? You absolutely can. So it skitters across the ground and goes into your hand. Just as you uh, grab it, you can see that emerging into the room and standing amidst the fire is Stitch. Just looking super fucking badass. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> the hell's going on? Enemies, are you, are you okay? Sure. There, there are rocks. They're on top of me. Stitch, also there are flames coming towards her, and the room is filling with smoke. Stitch, if she can't walk, you might have to put the coin in her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna easily, like, move these rocks off of her. Okay, so basically, Stitch and Nico are going to be attempting to free Nico from the rubble. Stitch, I assume you're going to be using your strength. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nico, what are you going to be using? I mean, I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna use a spell. N- Nico's gonna hold hold her staff and say, "Sweet gains." <laughs> <laughs> you are attempting to give yourself super strength. Yes. So Stitch, roll your strength. Nico, roll your psyche. Yellow. Green. Stitch and Nico, between the super strength that the two of you have, you are able to free Nico from the rubble. Nico, you stand up, brush yourself off. Grab the Tome of Eternal Darkness. Immediately. Yeah, flee the room, which is uh, flaming and collapsing. So what's my strength right now, Dan? Uh, it, it was just for that one scene. Oh, okay. Uh, so sad. Had a taste of power. Yep. Okay, the rest of you, how are you dealing with this invasion? Morgan realizes that his skills are best utilized, kind of like sneaking behind enemy lines. So I'm going to portal like back behind the enemy. And then I was going to try to like sneak and disable one of their um, like siege weapons. Maybe like the thing with all the chains on it or one of the other ones. Is somebody going to go for Skeletor, by the way? That was the other thing I was thinking I, about. I, like... I was going to probably sniper rifle. I like how Bob and I basically traded roles on this team. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. What, Dante, what are you feeling? Sick. <laughs> Can someone carry me out on a stretcher onto the battlefield? <laughs> Can I just be like the general of moral support? I mean, Dante, you're you're not feeling so bad that you can't fight. Like you're you're not feeling a hundred percent, but it'll be a cold day in hell before Dante Sparta can't raise. Sorry, sword. that's that's me, not Dante. Oh, that's uh, you. Sure. I can go for Skeletor. So there's the grappling hooks, right? Yep, there's the grappling hooks, and there's the dudes with ladders that are trying to uh, bridge the chasm. I mean, I'm happy to sort of uh, knife those guys and then intimidate them away. If you want to do 300-style taking down Skeletor. Is there a harpoon gun? (laughs) Uh, Probably in the army somewhere, yeah. If you would get me that harpoon gun, I would be very happy. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I will do that immediately, Miss Hares. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so, Morden, you're planning on heading down to start sabotaging vehicles? Yeah. Are you uh, going for one vehicle in particular? Um, I'll probably start with the one that's shooting out the grappling hooks at the drawbridge. Helena, you are fighting and knifing off people as they're coming in on ladders. Yep. And Dante, it sounds like you're jumping down into the soldiers in order to steal a giant harpoon gun. Yeah. Cool. Morden, I'm going to need you to make a reason check with a bonus for stealth, which is a weird combination, (laughs) but there you go. Helena, I'm going to need you to make a fighting check with a bonus for close combat knives. And then Dante, I think you're going to use fighting to try to fight your way to that harpoon gun. Green. Green. I have not used these knives enough. <laughs> it was white. You okay. Break in the yeah, knives. It doesn't have enough blood <laughs> for good grip. So, Morden, uh, you portal down. You managed to set up your portal directly beneath the tank. And so you just sort of like pop up underneath it, reach up, and start just tearing away at some of its uh, components. It's very messy work, but it does not need to be precise for you to screw this thing up royally. That tank is not going to go anywhere. They can throw as many grappling hooks on the uh, Grayskull drawbridge as they want, and they won't be able to pull it down. Dante, you jump into the midst of the soldiers and begin to hack your way through. You manage to uh, hack your way to the harpoon gun, but at this point, the soldiers have closed ranks around you, and you are not seeing an immediate way out from them. 
And in the meantime, Helena, you're doing your best to stab the guys as they're coming, but there's just too many of them. For every one you manage to drop, there's like four more that hit the wall and begin swarming in. And I'm gonna say that the NPCs that you guys picked out are also on the wall with you fighting, but you guys are outnumbered at least like five to one by these guys as they're coming on. So, uh, what's everyone doing? And I include uh, Stitch and Nico in that as well. Can we say this harpoon gun is exceptionally large? <laughs> uh, sure. I see no immediate way out. Well, fuck that. <laughs> I grab onto the shaft of the harpoon <laughs> and aim it towards Castle Grayskull. And I reach with my toe and pull the trigger. This is a real stitch way of solving your problem right here, I have to I say. I go flying upon the harpoon. Okay, you're going to try to launch yourself on the giant harpoon towards salvation in Castle Grayskull. Very yes. good. Yeah, I'm going to need you to make an agility check then. I'm going to use karma. Take it to a yellow. Nice. You manage to plant the head of the harpoon just like a few inches below the lip of the outer wall of Castle Grayskull. And when it hits, you are, of course, hanging gracefully from underneath it. And so you are able to pull yourself up having shot yourself <laughs> clear of the uh, encroaching soldiers who stand at the edge of the chasm and shake their fist impotently at you as you return to the safety of the castle. With the harpoon. With the harpoon, of Good. course. I thought of this idea before thinking about, like, immediate context and who was attacking us, which just makes it better. So Dan, you know, assuming this works, interpret as you will. But considering we're in a stone castle, I was thinking it might be nice to have some more defenders, and I'm going to say gargoyles! <laughs> Yay! Oh, shit. Green. So this is the second time that you guys have been in a siege situation on Eternia and have turned to gargoyles to help you fight off the larger invading force. It is the second time if you listen to the bonus episode. True, true. So uh, with the wave of the Staff of One and the uttered word of power, the many gargoyles, which are indeed scattered around the ramparts of Castle Grayskull, suddenly stir to life as their limbs are animated by magic. They begin to stir to uh, serve Nico's orders. What is it that you would like to direct the gargoyles to do, Nico? To defend the castle in an immediate way, as in like, if people are climbing a ladder, knock the ones at the top off? Stuff like that, you know what I mean? Like... The most imminent threats get hit first. Yeah, that sounds good. You guys are definitely getting overwhelmed numerically on the walls, so this will help to fix that little uh, imbalance. Stitch is going to arrive shortly after Nico. He arrives after her because he took a little uh, detour to grab Marlene. Okay, Gotta very grab good. Marlene. Who do we got? We got ladder guys? Yeah, there's still ladder guys coming. The monsters th that were trying to grappling hook their, like, tank onto the the jaw bridge, which is, by the way, what it's called in Castle Grayskull oh is the jaw God. bridge, because it's in, like, the giant mouth. Anyway, so they've given up trying to get their tank to start, because it's just not, and they're just trying to, like, pull it down, but they're going to need about a hundred more guys on the chains before they can budge the jaw bridge. So, like, that's not an immediate threat. The guys on the, uh, on the ladders are a more imminent threat, or you could try to target, like, some of the siege weaponry that's out in the army. Are the ladders, like, close-ish to each other? Some of them are, yeah. Okay, cool. Stitch is gonna go over to one of the sets of ladders, sort of in, the, in between all the others that are trying to come up, grab it, hoist it, and then use it to whack the other ladders. Oh, nice. Filled with people coming up, just... <laughs> and there are still guys clinging to the ladder yes. which you are swinging around. Oh, absolutely. Also. <laughs> yeah, very good. Uh, so give me a fighting check for that. Ah, oh, white. No good. Yeah, well, it's it's not working out quite so well. They're, they're hanging on. You're not hitting them hard enough to uh, knock them down. Really, all you've done is momentarily delay them. Okay. I'm going to set up my sniper rifle and aim it. So this they're on that spider platform. When you start aiming, you actually realize that Skeletor and Demona are gone. They might have started, like, heading through the army or going somewhere else, but you can't spot them at the moment. I did not like this. Okay, is the spider thing still moving towards us? Uh, it is, yes. There is a pilot on it still. I feel like I should go find them. So you're, you're trying to find where Skeletor and Demona went to, basically. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to need you to make an intuition check with a bonus for perception. I'm going to use some karma for this. I'm going to take it to a green. So you are able to find Skeletor. Skeletor is seated on the back of a large purple furred panther, and he is currently riding through the ranks of his soldiers, trying to stir them up and direct them now that the jaw bridge operation has been slowed. So he's sort of like more on the ground and trying to direct people. So 
We don't know where Demona is? No. Can I spend a turn scanning the crowd for her? You're under a tank at the moment. I can roll back through my portal and pop back on like Castle Grayskull, so. So yeah, you come out back on the battlements and uh, you can give me an intuition with a bonus for perception to see if you can figure out where she went. Yeah, that's gonna be a yellow. You are indeed seeing her. She has gone in the opposite direction as Skeletor, and you can see that she's heading towards a group of what looks like Skeletor's lieutenants, maybe, who are beginning to mount on these weird flying vehicles. Right as you see that, they actually take off, and uh, you see they begin to fly toward Castle Grayskull and actually fly above the walls. You can see that there's four of them. They're on these, like, flying sky sled cycle things that they use to sort of pass over the army and the walls all together and begin to head toward the courtyard at the center of Castle Grayskull. Morton's going to turn to the rest of the people up on the wall and say, we have intruders coming in on aerial vehicles. We need to get to the courtyard with a small detachment of people to fight them off. Timothy Dalton Bond says, (laughs) uh, perhaps you should go then. We can hold them off on the wall for the time being. I don't think I can take this many by myself. I'm going to need a few people to come with. Nico looks at Morden and is like, well, I mean, I guess if you, you know, think magic might be useful in this situation, <laughs> then I can I say, know, come along. I say, we're really going to debate the merits of magic right now when our force field, which was apparently powered by magic, just failed us. Oh, so you agree that it was a magical thing. <laughs> Whatever it was, it didn't work very well. I'm imagining this conversation is going as you guys are running. Yeah. <laughs> Stitch pops his head out of Helena's hair. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so all of you arrive in uh, the courtyard of Castle Grayskull. You see that the four vehicles have touched down, and the lieutenants that were on them have dismounted and are attempting to find their way when they see you enter. There is a very burly ape-like man with orange fur. There's one guy who looks incredibly fish-like, uh, covered uh-huh. in gills with like these weird fins coming out of the sides of his head. There's one guy who's this, like, blue-skinned humanoid, but he has these red cybernetic parts, including a very large red lower jaw and a big arm that's like a gun. Almost like a trap jaw, if you will. Almost, one would say, like a trap jaw. And then there's a woman dressed in this, like, form-fitting black gown and a very impressive-looking headpiece with uh, this staff topped by a crystal. So those are the four that have arrived, those are the four that turn to you, and those are the four that are rolling initiative. I got a three. And I got ten. I got an eight. Ten. And Stitch? Twelve. Eva Lynn is going first. She holds out her staff in all of your directions and says, Die! Wow, I hadn't thought of that one. (laughs) That's so good. (laughs) Oh, shit. The orb on the end glows briefly as arcs of lightning streak out. Oh, and she misses horrifically. You know, this is a kid's cartoon, so, like, all of the attacks always land right next to the hero and, like, you know, maybe (laughs) throw them off balance for a second. Make a bunch of rubble fall down from the ceiling and then we dodge out of the way of it. Exactly. All right, Stitch, you're dodging rubble. Stitch is going to dive out of uh, Helena's hair and then skitter up and over to uh, Trapjaw. Okay. And try to rip off his mechanical arm. I had a feeling you might start collecting more mechanical arms. All right, give me a strength check. I'm pulling a Magnus on this fool. Yes. Okay, I'll use Karma. I got a red. Uh, Yeah, you rip his arm clean off. Just (laughs) right at the shoulder, pops off, sparks flying. His his eyes just go wide and he spends several long seconds just staring at where his arm used to be. Mine. Dante, you are up. I don't know what the fuck to do. There's a big gorilla man. There's merman. You do have a sword. No, 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 There's an arm with cyborg. I have a harpoon. You have guns. I'm going for merman. (laughs) You have a character with all of these weapons on him at all times and you never use them. (laughs) Well... I'm using the harpoon this time. (laughs) (laughs) I'm hunting merman. I mean, that's appropriate, isn't it? Are you chucking at him? Are you, uh, like, running at him like it's a spear? Like, what are you doing with him? Uh, Olympic javelin throw. So you're going to be using your agility, and if you have ranged combat thrown weapons, you get a bonus for that. Yellow. Excellent. Uh, You've bullseyed him. Is there somewhere in particular you want to hit him? Is that even a question? Uh, I'm going to guess the dick. (laughs) No, the butthole. Oh, Jesus. He's not a zombie. His left nipple. Okay. (laughs) Fuck that nipple in particular. Your harpoon goes sailing and buries itself a good inch or two into Merman's chest. He's sort of stumbling around like gurgling in a panic as this giant harpoon is swinging back and forth. Helena, you are up. I'm going to use Dante's shoulders and just 
fling myself onto Beastman's the gorilla. Yes. Yeah, and just start knifing. Go for it. Roll your uh, fighting with a bonus for close combat knife. I shiver at her touch. (laughs) (laughs) That's a green. All right, so Helena has leapt onto Beastman and is beginning to stab furiously. Morden, what would you like to do? Um, how many of them kind of hit with an area incinerate? Uh, you can hit two of them. Two of them? Uh, I will point out that Stitch is currently in melee with Trapjaw, and Helena is physically on top of Beastman. Right, so um, I'll go Evelyn and Merman then. I uh, got a green. So uh, Evelyn's force field springs up as the flames begin to burst around her, so she is protected. Her force field is damaged, but still active. Merman is not so lucky, and now he is running around with a harpoon sticking out of his chest and on fire. Aww. So This is like the worst state for a fish. It's not great. It's a real Monday. <laughs> Morden's going to say, um, keep hitting that force field. So it's Trapjaw's turn, and I think at this point, he's just going to try to get his arm back from Stitch. I mean, that's his gun, right? Yeah, that's his gun. <laughs> uh, so he's going to try to he's gonna try to grab it from you. Uh, he fails. <laughs> I, I think he's just chasing you around the courtyard, <laughs> remaining hand outstretched, trying to grab at you as you scamper ahead of him. Uh, it's poor Merman's turn. There are no aquatic creatures around for him to control. So, uh, he's gonna pull the harpoon out of his chest, and he's gonna run at Dante with it. Still on fire, I will add. (laughs) Dante, you parry him aside with your sword pathetically easily. Not a good day for Merman. Nico, it is your turn. I'm gonna point my staff at Evelyn and say, Trapped in a box? Referencing the, uh, the mime trick. Basically, the idea is her force field is going to crush her. Interesting. You're turning her force field against her. Yes. That's pretty clever. Okay, let's see how it goes. That is green, barely. Her force field does indeed begin to constrict around her, and uh, she begins to take damage. And it is Beastman's turn. Beastman is unhappy with this tiny hairless ape that is uh, stabbing him repeatedly. So he uh, lets out a grunt and is going to try to tear you off, Helena. Helena, he manages to kind of like grab you by the scruff of the neck and rips you off of him. Uh, He doesn't do any damage to you, but he is currently grappling you. So you're kind of being held in place by him at the moment. It is Eva Lynn's turn. Uh, She's going to try to dispel her own force field uh, and successfully does so. Her force field drops and she is no longer taking damage. Good job. It is Stitch's turn. Stitch is going to skid to a stop, turn around to face a uh, trap jaw running at him, and then swing his own arm to try and, like, smash his, his robotic legs out from under him. Okay, let me see that fighting check. da 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 <laughs> Ah, no good. I think he, he uh, like, totally sees this shit's about to come. That's, that's a real shame, because then you could have said, stop hitting yourself. <laughs> that would have been great. <laughs> Dante, Merman is currently flailing ineffectually at you with the harpoon. I mean, do I really need to do anything with him? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that's up to you, dude. What's going on with Trapjaw? Uh, he's currently trying to get his arm back from Stitch. <laughs> Can I, uh, like, shoulder charge him? Yeah, uh, that would be an endurance check. Yellow. Excellent. You slam Trapjaw, which means that he goes flying through the stone wall of the courtyard. Uh, he's actually still up, believe it or not. He's, like, sprawled out amongst rubble and trying to stand up, which is harder because he only has one arm. But, uh, he's still up. Helena, it is your turn. You are being grappled by Beastman. Can I still maneuver a little bit? To some extent. You can't really move away from him until you break his grapple. I'm going to palm my knife and say, I did not really want to do this. And then basically cut through his tendons. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> All right, give me that uh, fighting check with the bonus for close combat knife. That's a yellow. Uh, yeah, you sever Beastman's tendons. <laughs> oh. Uh, he's not happy about that. No. One bit. Well, I'm covered in blood now, but it's how I prefer to be. Morden, it is your turn. What would you like to do? So Morden's going to turn to Nico, um, noticing that the force field dropped and say, See, look how unreliable these magical barriers are. I knew it couldn't stand up to my incineration tech. <laughs> Nico's just going to smile and nod. <laughs> yeah. Morden's going to go uh, for a headshot against Evelyn with the uh, hand cannon. Green. All right, so you don't headshot her. I'll say you hit her in, in, like, her upper chest. She stumbles back a few steps, shocked that she was, like, physically hit, as though she is only now putting together the fact that maybe dropping her force field in the middle of a fight was a suboptimal choice. Trapjaw climbs to his feet and is just going to try to straight-up bite Stitch. 
Uh, yeah, he chomps on you hard. That is 30 damage to Stitch. Ouch. That's one hell of a chomper. I guess it is, like, part of his name, so... Right. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of his deal. <laughs> yeah. Dante, you hear Merman come running up behind you saying, Don't you run away from me! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and is going to try to harpoon you again. And he does so. Uh, he plants the harpoon right between your shoulder blades. <gasps> Jesus. Dante, you take 50 damage. Nico, it is your turn. I'm, you know what? I'm going to be nice on this one. I'm going to compliment Evelyn on her staff. Specifically, I'm going to inform her that that, that staff, staff is the bomb. bomb. <laughs> so good. That's a green. Uh, okay, her staff explodes <laughs> and she falls motionless to the ground. Nice. <laughs> And see these magical artifacts she has? They're so unreliable, exploding all over the place. Absolutely. <laughs> Beastman is going to have to make a, a psyche check to see if he wants to stay in this fight now that his arm is useless. And he fails! Beastman turns to run. Goodbye, Beastman. Stitch, you're up. Stitch bares his teeth at Trap Jaw, extends his extra set of arms, and with three of those arms, grabs onto Trap Jaw, and then with, with the fourth, grabs his his lower jaw and then wrenches it off. <laughs> Man, you guys are going to town on these He-Man villains. <laughs> just bit me. <laughs> Karma. Th- this is probably like the fate of most of my He-Man action figures, I think. After <laughs> I know, right? So I'm going to take it to a yellow. Yeah, you tear his jaw off, his eyes cross, and he passes out. <laughs> <laughs> More like scrap jaw. And he throws his jaw at him. (laughs) And I assume you put on sunglasses. Uh, I don't have them yet. I'm waiting for someone. Sick burn. Dante, what would you like to do? Who's left? Merman and Beastman is running. I will point out Merman just stabbed you with the harpoon. He smells like burnt fish. Not my favorite. I guess I'll throw him. (laughs) Uh, Give me a strength check. There will come a day when Dante uses one of the weapons his character sheet came <laughs> with, but it is not this day. <laughs> That's a green! Uh, not good enough to grab him, unfortunately. Merman dances out of the way of your grasp. Helena, Beastman is running away from you. What would you like to do? I'm not very worried about Beastman. I am going to sneak up behind Merman while he's distracted and then hold a knife behind him and uh, intimidate him into leaving nice hairs alone. Okay, great. Uh, So you're going to roll me a Psyche plus Intimidation. Bless you, Sestra. That's a red. He immediately drops the harpoon and just sort of like drops onto the ground in surrender with a, a couple of small spot fires still burning at various points on him. You guys have managed to fend off... Dan, hold on. I want to do one more spell real quick. Please. On on, on Beastman. All right. I'm going to point my staff at him as he's running and say, (laughs) Rake. Let's see it happen. That's a green. So a rake appears directly in front of him. (laughs) He steps on it and it flips up, hitting him in the face and he goes down. (laughs) So you guys have repelled Skeletor's lieutenants, which had directly infiltrated the interior of Castle Grayskull. You're uh, preparing to return to the fight when you hear what sounds like a bird cry from above. Looking up, you see that a large bird with orange and blue plumage flies down and lands in front of you. Uh, And Morden, you recognize this bird because you've seen it around Castle Grayskull before. It's proven too wily for any of my traps. (laughs) Indeed. As you are contemplating potentially trying to trap it this time uh, and wondering if you have enough time to before, you know, Castle of Grayskull is uh, is invaded. All of you hear a female voice echo in your heads. Heroes, I am the sorceress of Castle Grayskull. I'm afraid there isn't much time. Skeletor's attack has greatly weakened the protective wards on Castle Grayskull. If we don't act now, all could be lost. Okay, so I have some questions. <laughs> Sadly, there is no time for questions. Held within this fortress is an ancient power, sealed away in ages past to prevent it from falling into the hands of evil. Only a true hero can open the secret passage, which leads to the Sword of Power. One of you must wield the sword, beat back Skeletor's forces, and defend the secrets of Castle Grayskull. Nico rolls her eyes like super hard right now. (laughs) I'm not much of a sword guy. Helena is nodding very seriously at what this bird has to say. Last last time that one got one, it didn't turn out so well. Pointing at Dante. So this sword is an instrument of good? It is. An instrument of good and an instrument of incredible power. 
I don't know much about this whole magic thing, but if there was a someone got a bad sword, can like a good sword fix that? <laughs> okay. So this eye roll can be heard from like Alpha Centauri. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know, and I'm afraid we don't have much time. Where is it? Follow me, I shall show you. And with that, she flaps her wings and begins flying off back into the uh, interior halls of the castle. Cancel out evil sword. I don't know how this stuff works. You guys seem to be making it up as you go. <laughs> <laughs> All of you are taken to an otherwise unremarkable corridor in Castle Grayskull. However, once you draw near, a door seems to form itself out of the stone wall, just like becoming first like an outline and then gaining dimensionality. And before you actually reach it, it is a fully fledged stone door that wasn't there a second ago. Once open, the door leads to a long winding stone staircase, which drops beneath Castle Grayskull. And following it, you eventually emerge into a cavernous space, which is lined with colossal stone statues. The stairs themselves lead down to a platform surrounded by a seemingly bottomless abyss. Upon the platform itself is a large metal sword embedded point down in the center. The bird-like sorceress at this point glides over to the sword and perches on the upward pointed handle. Magical light surrounds her as she begins to shift and change, transforming into a winged humanoid figure. Although, with a jolt, you realize that this figure is Demona. <laughs> Demona stands in the center of the platform with her fingers wrapped around the handle of the sword. She draws it forcefully, raises it above her head, and says, By the power of Grayskull! Can Stitch tackle her? Uh, you can make the attempt. Uh, make make, an, agil- er, make a, uh, an endurance check. That's a yellow. You go running forward, bolting down the stairs and across the platform as a cacophonous explosion of lightning bolts crash down on the upraised sword and Demona seems to be consumed momentarily by the light. You leap forward and hit her as hard as you can. Mm -hmm. And like, this is a blow that would knock down stone walls. You could knock over a train with this. You hit her and roll back stunned. Uh, (laughs) The light clears, and you see that Demona has been transformed. Her muscles are visibly larger and better defined, but more than a physical change is the aura coming off of her. Like, even though uh, most of you guys are still kind of distant from her, the power radiating off of her is like standing next to a bonfire. She glances down at Stitch. You're lying on your back trying to uh, clear your head. She grins and then looks down appreciatively at her new sword and says triumphantly, I have the power. Extraordinary League is produced by Dan Mulcairn with logo design by Claire Mulcairn. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod at Incompetech.com for our theme song, Motherload and to tabletopaudio.com for our background music and ambient sound effects. You can find us on Twitter at Smash Fic Podcast and search for the Smash Fiction Podcast on Facebook, Tumblr, and YouTube. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice, and if you leave us a good review, we shall become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Smash Fiction is made possible thanks to our supporters on Patreon at patreon.com slash smashfictionpodcast. Please consider donating as little as a dollar each month. It helps us keep the show going, and we have great rewards and extra content for those who help us out. If you have any suggestions, feedback, or other contributions, send them to us at smashfictionpodcast at gmail.com and help us continue the fight. Also, Uh, she has Uggs now. (laughs) Can I just say real quick? Demon! Dun, 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 dun! (laughs) Can, uh, did her red hair become a page boy haircut? <laughs> Absolutely. Oh my god. <laughs> Dan's shenanigans, I don't know, man. His shenanigans, shenanigans but I don't. Shenanigans. Ah. There you go. Oh, right. yes. uh, oh, fuck, Dan. There's your Twitter name. Wait, is it shenanigans or shenanigans? <laughs> oh, oh that's tough.
Shenanigans. Shenanigans. I think it's Shenanigans. Okay, sh- uh. that sounds like a friggin' like family restaurant. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I like it.